Okay, good morning. Good. Uh, the last time uh, this year, Tafshin and Payela could be learned together. Uh, next week, we'll have Shir again, as will be the next year, Tafshin and Pei Bet. So, um, yeah, wish everyone a good year, a healthy year, a year of prosperity, a year of uh, Nachat. Grat Hashem to all. Um, I'll say a few words about uh, regarding uh, Rosh Hashanah, not halachically, but uh, spiritually. Uh, a little bit of preparation for Rosh Hashanah, besides it being, besides it being Shemitah, it's also regular Rosh Hashanah, uh, as every year. And then we go to our uh, Shemitah class. We'll continue our Shemitah class. Um, <clears throat> so, hi, good morning. Um, Regarding Rosh Hashanah, there's a lot to speak about, but uh, uh, we'll say one uh, general idea. Um, we know Chazal say that David Hashem Ori Bishi Ori Berosh Hashanah Bishi Biyom Kippurim, meaning that Hashem is our light on Rosh Hashanah and our salvation on Yom Kippur. That's why it's customary by the Ashkenazim to say the Psalm of Tehillim of Kafzain 27, uh, Rosh Hashanah and Kippur all these days. We'll soon speak about Elul also. He started from Aleph Elul to say, maybe the Shemori Bishi, not just by tomorrow night. Uh, but it definitely includes Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. And then in the continuation of the Pesukim there, it says, Ki tzpeneini b'suko b'yom ra'ah. So the word Sukkot, Sukkot, appears as well. So that's why we continue it on till Hoshana Rabbah, till the last day of Sukkot. That's when we finish saying it uh, uh, after 51 days from Rosh Chodesh Elul till the 21st of uh, Tishrei. Um, so what is the light? What is Rosh Hashanah? Why does Rosh Hashanah resemble the light? Hashem Ori. We understand Yom Kippur as being Ish'i, our salvation, our savior, because Yom Kippur is a day of an, an anointment when Hashem forgives all our, hopefully, forgives all our sins if we do proper tshuva, if we repent, if we confess, we do, and Hashem accepts, accepts our, uh, uh, forgives us for what we have done. So that we understand why it's considered Ish'i. But why is Rosh Hashanah considered Ori? What is the special light of Rosh Hashanah? And one, in general, what's the idea of Rosh Hashanah? Namely, because we don't even mention sins on Rosh Hashanah. We don't ask for forgiveness. It's the day of judgment, Yom Adin. And here we are, standing in front of the King of Kings, uh, acting on Rosh Hashanah as the judge, Melech HaMishpat, the King of Judgment, and we don't even ask one word of forgiveness what we've done. So for what, why would, why, why would we think, why should we hope that Hashem uh, will accept us? And not only that, in the tour it says that we're accustomed to wearing big day chag, big day yom tov for Rosh Hashanah. We wear nice clothes. And we uh, take, take haircuts and we shave and we're all Set, set up beautifully as best, as best as we can for Rosh Hashanah. What's so festive about it? Why are we so happy? We don't know yet what our judgment will be. We don't know yet. We're still 50-50, a chance of being uh, uh, accepted in front of Hashem and, and His mercy will give us life or chas v'chayla, the opposite. So why, what are we so happy about? So all these questions accumulate to uh, the understanding of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the day of our potential. We don't look at our actions on Rosh Hashanah. We don't look at our deeds on Rosh Hashanah. As we said, we don't mention them. Not for the good, nor for the bad. We don't speak about anything we've done during the year. That's Yom Kippur, we speak many, many, many times over and over again and all that we've done, especially the bad things we've done and we regret them 
and we clap our, we hit on our chests and all that. But Rosh Hashanah, no mentioning of good deeds nor bad deeds. All we mention Rosh Hashanah is the greatness of Hashem, His kingdomship, the creation of the world, giving the Matan Torah, the Machuyot, Zichonot, Shofarot, all the praise we can of Hashem and uh, accepting Him as King of Kings. And uh, we speak of ourselves as a nation. As a nation, we mention a lot of things. Ten kavod Hashem le'amecha, tila li'reecha, ikvat tabale doshecha. As a collective, as a tzibur, as a congregation, as a nation, that we speak about a lot, that Hashem, Hashem should uh, present us in the world as we're meant to be, as the chosen people and that the world will respect us. And we mention the entire world accepting Hashem as their king, accepting Hashem as their Lord. And everyone in the world, all creatures, should all accept you, Hashem, as their king, as their Lord. So that's really the light of Rosh Hashanah. The light of Rosh Hashanah is that we should be canceling our own personality and connecting and uniting with our entire nation, the entire people. We're not looking, we're not being inspected personally, although the Day of Judgment does include personal inspection by Hashem. It says, Vovrin lefanav kivnei maron, kevakarat edro, that same as a shepherd, uh, each sheep passes by, he counts each and every sheep, and he inspects each and every sheep to check if it's okay or not. That's how we're inspected. But we don't regard that as our focus on Rosh Hashanah. That's Hashem's dealings for Rosh Hashanah. We don't look at ourselves as, a person, as a, in a personal way. Rather, we include ourselves in the collective. We nullify ourselves, our beings, to be part of the collective, part of the nation, as a united nation. That's the idea of Rosh Hashanah, to regard ourselves all together as one whole huge collective, to be bringing forth Hashem's uh, reigning, Hashem's kingdomship to the world through our nation. So Dafka, it's, it's, it's the day that is filled with light because that's the potential we have in us. The potential is holy. Our potential is pure. And therefore, we don't look at our personality per se, or, or, or specifically our deeds, uh, good or bad, good or bad. We just look at the purity in us, which is the fact that we're all part of one whole nation. And being all together, that's the abbreviations of the word sibu, all inclusive, makes us all uh, pure and holy as a collective. Then the rest of the days of Asher Semei Tshuva, that's when we start doing Tshuva over our personal actions and acts and deeds, good or bad, and we try to perfect ourselves as, as individuals. But in Rosh Hashanah, don't think of it at all. Don't think of your, pers of, of, of your personal status. It's not the day to think of yourself. It's the day to think of the collective, of being fortunate to be part of the Jewish people. That's it. That's the day of Rosh Hashanah. And to be fortunate to have Hashem as our king. And to be fortunate to be the ones that declare and announce and, 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 and publicize Hashem as the king. That's all it is. Uh, the Zohar Kadosh, the Zohar Kadosh um, explains uh, in the, no, we don't read this in the Aftara, we don't read this in the Aftara Rosh Hashanah, but uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Melachim, where uh, the, the Navi describes Elisha, Elisha Navi, he used to go uh, from town to town uh, as a prophet. To, to lead the people, to prophesize to the people, to, to correct their ways. So he always used to visit in a certain town. He used to go to a certain woman who, was, uh, who hosted him very nicely. 
Aisha Shunamit. She was hosting him very nicely. And Vahia uh, Yom, one of those times of many times, numerous times that he used to go to her uh, when he used to come down to her, come around to her town. Vahia Yom. And Isha suddenly realizes, wait, she's such a great host for us. Let's do something for her. Let's be gift her because she's uh, worthy of, of, of a gift from us because uh, us meaning Elisha and Gei Chazi, his, uh, his servant. Shamish, right. Na'aro, his servant. So Elisha says to Gei Chazi, go to the woman and ask her, what does she need? What is she missing in life that we can help her out with? And remember, a prophet like Elisha, if he asks for something from Hashem, he gets it. So whatever she needs is, is, is automatically uh, received. So he goes to her. And remember the word, he goes to her. And he says to her, uh, what, what are you missing in your life? What would you like? My, 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 my rabbi, the prophet, Edisha, would like to be gifted with something because you're such a nice host. And she says, Betoch ami anochi yoshavit. I'm, I dwell within my nation. I dwell within my nation. That's her answer. The meaning of that answer is, who, who cares about me? It's not about me. It's about my nation. And my nation, as part of the nation, everything's fine. My needs don't count for anything. All I care about is my nation. You want to do something good for the nation? That's what Elisha was doing anyhow. Elisha was going all around in order to perfect the people and make the nation stronger and better and more obedient and more and closer to Hashem. But why are you asking me what I need personally? Not nothing. It's it's it's, it's zero. It has no 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 effect. No, uh, there's no not necessary for anything to do for me as a as an individual. I'm part of the nation. That was their answer. It's the highest level a person can ever reach. And taking into account that when he comes back to Elisha, Elisha, and gives and tells him her answer, Elisha presses stronger. He says, still, there has to be something that she needs personally. It can't be that she's all content, all complete, all, all fine, all perfect. So Gehazi says on his own, he doesn't hear this from her. On his own, he says, well, you know, if you've noticed, I don't know if you've noticed, every time we come, it's a quiet home. It's only her and her husband. She has no children. She was deprived of, of children. She wasn't fertile. So now imagine her answer. She's a, she's a woman, married, many years, no children. That's one of the most difficult misiones a person can ever have, especially for the woman. When her teva, her nature, is to bear children and to rear children and to raise children and, 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 and give, bring life to the world. And even so, she could have easily, easily, easily answered back, of course, I need kids. I need a child. But her answer was, I'm part of the nation. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't matter about me personally. It's not, that's not the issue. And of course, Elisha hears this, so he blesses her with a child, and she actually conceives and she has a child. Then there's a whole story of the child dying, and Elisha uh, doing like a respiratory on him and reviving him, and he comes back to life, this whole story. Uh, some say, by the way, that that was Yona Hanavi. That shot was Yona Hanavi in the end. Some say that in Midrash of Chazam. But says the Zohar Kadosh, you know what day that was? That Elisha had visited the uh, Isha Shunamit and asked her for what, what does she want? Ah, and it says there uh, that he tells Gehazi to ask her, What would you like? I will speak to the king in your name for, for your sake with whatever you request, whatever you want. Says Hazor Kadosh. Anytime it says Hayom, and I said before, Vahi Hayom. Anytime in the Tanakh it says Hayom, Rosh Hashanah. That was on Rosh Hashanah. This is the day of the reigning of the king. This is the day that he judges everyone. 
This is the day to ask for your needs. And she answers back, no, it isn't. This isn't the day for personal needs. This is the day to combine ourselves within the community, within the collective, not care about ourselves. And the Zohar Kadosh, based on this Pasuk, says that on Rosh Hashanah, if a person asks for his own needs, then he's missing the whole point of Rosh Hashanah. He says, if you ask, we think that's the day. We would think that. True. From a Kodesh Baruch's point of view. How do you not think about that? <laughs> that's what's... I, I'm sorry. I agree. I agree. I agree. That's what's so tremendous about her answer because she had so much to think about with that bearing children. So much to think about her personal life, not just Parnasa. Or not just uh, little issues with her husband uh, fighting here or there. She had no kids for years. And yet, she was able to put all that aside, not think of herself, and think of Klal Yisrael. I'm, a, I'm just a piece of dust with, uh, with regards to whatever I mean. It's the idea of being part of Am Yisrael. That's the main focus. You're right. It's a day of judgment, and that day, Hashem decides for the entire year what type of life we're going to have, how much parnasa we're going to have, what uh, good things or bad things will happen to the world, to our nation, to our country, to ourselves, to each and every individual. True, this is a day of judgment for the entire world, for everything that's going to happen during the year. Parnasa is decided upon, determined from Rosh Hashanah to the to the other, to, to, to the next Rosh Hashanah. But that's Hashem. Hashem deals with all that. That's his issue. That's his job. That's his task in Rosh Hashanah. Our, the essence for us of Rosh Hashanah is not to think of all that. The less we think of all that, the more we can bind ourselves within the collective, the more we want to do good for the, for the world to, to make Hashem reign over the world, to make Hashem uh, uh, glorified, to glorify Him in the world, to, t- to take Am Yisrael and bring it up to another level, to connect, to unite to every single Jew. If that's all we're thinking of, then Hashem's judgments for our parnasa and having children and being well and being healthy and all that will be in our favor. But if we speak about those things, that ruins it for us for those things to be said. Because we're being selfish. We're being selfish. We're, we're, we're caring about ourselves. And that's not the meaning of Rosh Hashanah. So Dafka, in order to deserve, if there are any schuyot that we can that we can deserve things for, we say, "Avinu makenu chonenu vaninu ki ein manu masim." I say, "Manu tzedaka v'chesed v'oshienu." We know we have so much to correct. We have, if, if he judges us by our deeds, oy, oy, oy. <laughs> there's no way we can pass. We can pass judgment that day. But if we ignore, so to speaking, ourselves and connect ourselves to the collective and look at our potential, not our actual, our actual deeds, but our potential, which is completely holy, which is completely straight. Says Kohelet, Hashem created us pure, holy, straight, uh, 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 righteous. We ruined it. We flunked it by doing all kinds of bad things, bad deeds. But go to our potential. Look at who we are potentially. That's what we're connecting to on Rosh Hashanah. Well, can you tie that in then to yes. what you're supposed to be doing the rest of your series to make tshuva, which is very focused on True. the mistakes I've made and whatever. Yeah, we said before, you break it down after you've seen the light. Of Rosh Hashanah, now you break it down to your actual personal deeds. Because in order to perfect the collective, you need to be a better human being. After all, you are part of the collective. <laughs> it's you and I and me and him that make up the nation. So then we strive to be better people personally. And that's the days between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, so to me, Tshuva, and in Kippur especially, the day of Ish'i. That's how we began. Hashem Ori, Ori is Rosh Hashanah. Hashem is my light. Ish'i is Yom Kippur. My uh, salvation. Because Yom Kippur 
is a rescue day for us if we've done tshuva properly. That's already a person. Yom Kippur is already on the personal level. Then we're supposed to speak about ourselves, how much we regret all the bad things we've done, how much we want to do only good, how much we're full of busha and klima. There we speak a lot, a lot about ourselves within the context of the collective. Ashamnu, bagadnu, gazanu. We don't speak ashamti, bagadti, gazal. It's still within the nation, but there we speak about deeds, good or bad. But that's in order to reach from the potential. Always there's a potential, and then we have to actualize it. So the ori, the light, the great light is Rosh Hashanah. It's only light, only positive. It's not one iota of negative words in the entire davening of Rosh Hashanah. No mentioning of sins, no mentioning of bad deeds, nothing. It's just the goodness of Hashem, the greatness of Hashem, the holiness of Hashem, and the collective of the nation. It's all about the greatness. But that's a potential in the world. We haven't actualized it yet. We're not there yet. So then we have to break it down in 10 days, in the remaining eight days, to break it down to the actual deeds, our actual personalities, and make them fit our potential. We want to always try to make our personality fit our potential. You're saying to the extent that you really work on perfecting yourself during those remaining eight days, you can be an effective part of that collective. Exactly, 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 exactly. Not just be. Uh, nullify to the collective like we did on Rosh Hashanah, but to actually perfect the collective. Make it better and better because you become better and better yourself. That's how the circle is between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. And everyone, that, that, this answers the question everyone asks, how come Rosh Hashanah is before Yom Kippur? Normally, if, you're go, if you have to go in front of a judge for, for human judgment, in front of a court, and, and, and you may have done something wrong, so normally you first ask for forgiveness and you do all kinds of things to, 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 to uh, pay back uh, what you've done wrong and all that. And then you go in front of the judge and you said, and you said to him, yes, I was wrong, but I did this and that to correct what I did. Here's the opposite. We go in front of the judge firstly on Rosh Hashanah. And then we start asking forgiveness and, 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 and we've done the wrong things and we're going to do only good and, we, and we're, we're going to change. But it's too late. You were judged on Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> so how come only after that did you do tshuva? Now, although Elul, the whole month of Elul, is a month of tshuva, we're supposed to go through the process of tshuva during the month of Elul, but that's not in the psukim. That's something that was added on later, the idea of Elul being the month of, of tshuva, of repentance, <clears throat> of mercy. But in essence, in David Amelech's uh, Psalm of Tehillim, it starts from Rosh Hashanah. Kippur first. First, go through eight days of begging forgiveness and asking, saying you're sorry and apologizing and saying you'll change your ways and you'll be a better person and all that. And then the last two days should have been Rosh Hashanah. Now I can come in front of the judge, all clean, all white, all perfect. Now I've done Shuvah. Now I can come in front of Hashem and say, Hashem, you're the Lord, you're great, and here I'm with you and all that. But the way the Zohar Kadosh explains to us, it's the opposite. We need Rosh Hashanah in order to get to Yom Kippur. Because if we are inspected personally, we'll never make it through. We need Rosh Hashanah to feel part of the collective, to feel part of Kalal Yisrael, to ignore, quote-unquote, ourselves for two days. Feel part of the collective, and that's totally purity, totally holiness, because that's really what's inside us. That's really what we want. That's really what we care for, what we desire inside internally. After you've expressed that, then you can actualize it. But the judgment is on that, is on your potential, is where you want to be, not where you are right now specifically. If Hashem sees your ratzon, sees your, 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 your intent, where are you striving to, what are your desires, this, which is Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is all our desires. Not necessarily who we are right now. It's where we desire to be. That's Rosh Hashanah. If he sees where your desires are, then he judges you favorably. Then he's Ori, then he's your light.
But then you have to break it down to be that person. It's not enough to desire. Now let's see you actualize. Let's see you go upon, live upon it. That's the idea of uh, Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. Um, <clears throat> just one last point. This fits very well with a Tosfos in Moses Rosh Hashanah, where the Tosfos speak about the discrepancy or the argument between Rabbi Leez and Rabbi Yoshua, when was the world actually created? Because after all, Rosh Hashanah resembles the creation of the world as well. So Rabbi Eliezer, I believe, says that it's Tishrei. And Rabbi Yoshua says it's a Nisan. The creation of the world was Nisan, not Tishrei. So says the Tosfos, say the Tosfos, that really it's bo- both are right. Both are correct. How is that? Says the Tosfos. Meaning, if we can speak this way about Hashem, we don't know, it's, it's, it's something that's not, it's inhuman, but in our way of, of speech, it's as if Hashem had planned the creation of the world on Tishrei and Rosh Hashanah and didn't actually create the world till Nisan. That's how Tosfos decide finally that, that that's what was in the world. The world wasn't actually created in Rosh Hashanah. We all think we stare, the, stare there and pray. Oh, what is Hayom Harat Olam? What does the word Harat mean? By the way, it's very Harat. funny. Exactly, exactly. When we get pregnant, takes nine months for the baby to develop. Exactly. That's the exact idea. But before, I'm just going to say a joking way. In the Avar Ashkenazi, those who dive in Ashkenazis, where they say the Saf and the O oh and all that. So for them, <laughs> it's very funny. I, I always raise a laughing when I hear this. Ayom haras olam. Today, the day was, the world was ruined, destroyed. Haras is to ruin, to destroy. So it's a little funny that that's how it turns out in their speech. But I personally say it harat, so it's good. <laughs> I'm saved from that uh, different content. Anyway, so what does harat olam mean? Today is a day of conceiving, herayon, when the woman gets pregnant, that's harat, herayon. Now, when you get pregnant, it's not yet an actual baby born, it's the fetus that's just developing. So we say at the, on the day of Rosh Hashanah, by the Tkiot, we say today is a day of conceiving of the world, not the day of, 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 of birth, of the, of giving birth to the world, of creating the world, actually. So here, there's a con- the conceiving began Aleph Tishrei, and it went through six months until Aleph Nisan. There was a preemie. <laughs> the, the, world, the world was a preemie. Why are you sure? What do you have Nisan when the world created? That's a, good, that's a good question. I believe it's the first day, because uh, that's parallel to Aleph Tishrei. Tetvav Nisan is parallel to Tetvav Tishrei, which is Sukkot and Pesach, but it doesn't have to do anything with the world. Well, Adar, already Kaf He Adar, the world was being created. The Correct. Day. Correct. Correct. It's the sixth day, as right. Aleph uh, Nisa, which right. was the day of, uh, of the and creation Adar of Adam Marisha. Adar, the world is Exactly. Which actually gets very right. right. And Kaf He Elul was the first day of conceiving of the world, of the planning of the world. Uh, of the light of all that until the day of Hashanah, which is the sixth day of creation, or the sixth day of the planning of creation, which was uh, Adam and Eve. So now, what, what, why is that? Why does that fit perfectly what we said in the name of Zohar, and we say all oh, that we spoke of before? Because that's exactly it. Allah Barot, Rosh Hashanah is Hashem's desire to create the world. Ad Nisan. It wasn't actualized till Nisan. So the day of Rosh Hashanah is Allah b'machshavah. The day of Rosh Hashanah is not our actualization of our lives. It's the, it's, the, it's the desire. It's the planning. It's the who we are internally, not the actualization of who we are. That's the whole meaning of Rosh Hashanah. That's the whole point of Rosh Hashanah. And if at that we're connected to ourselves truly with our to our purity to what we want to be, then we're worshiping Hashem properly on Rosh Hashanah, then he'll judge us favorably.
<laughs> I'm sure you spoke. Yeah, I understand. I get that. I get that. But uh, after all, uh, I'm sure you felt part of Kalal Yisrael no matter what. And you, you're always praying for the good of everyone. And it's just that, it's just to put the great emphasis on everyone, on the collective, on the nation, on the purity, on the desire and all that, rather than all our personal issues. Leave that for later. Leave that for a sense of a tshuva, leave that for a kipper, leave that for later. But Shoshana, don't think of that, don't speak of that, don't pray for that, nothing. And that's a way, I'm not saying this as a trick, one tiny second, I'm not saying it's a trick or a sgula, it's true. The Zohar says, if you do that, then you'll be judged favorably for all those needs that you have. So it's not, we shouldn't look at it as, okay, so now we know how to trick Hashem. Right. But, uh, yeah. The, yeah, don't think of it that way. Think of it truthfully. That's what's meant to be this day, and that's it. Because really all I desire is good and holiness and purity and, uh, and, and to be part of Kali Israel and all that. It's really what I desire. That's really what all, all I really care for. Try that day not to play the trick that this way will get what you want, but that day you try, try to be at the point where this woman was, she, she, as if you have everything you need that day. The prophet said the woman wasn't realistic. The prophet says that this, this is not the way to act. You must need something. How can, we, how can I not pay, pray for my parents? How can I pray for my children that day? That's what the prophet is saying to her. He's not he's saying that. Saying. He's not saying that. He's she saying has since she has she has needs. Right. He's I saying she needs your parents, your children, your grandchildren. Right. Those yourselves, are yourselves, your wife. Huh? Right. Yourselves, those, your those, wives. Those, those, those are your needs. for everyone. Right. But I think Elisha was saying to her, was saying to Gehazi, since she's such a righteous person, I would even, according to the Zohar Kadosh, and this is Zohar's explanation. So I would even say that maybe if she had asked for that, when Gehazi first approached her and said, what do you need? What do you need this day? If she had said, I need children, according to the Zohar Kodesh, she may not have received them. She may not have gotten them. I don't know. I can't tell because we don't know what would happen if. But uh, it seems like if she, would ask, if she would have asked for her personal needs and she would have said, I need kids, he may have said to her, what are you, nuts? That's something that so, only a shank can do. I'm, that's too much to ask him. I'm just a prophet. I'm not a shem. Shem decides if you have kids or not. Ask for something <laughs> easier <laughs> for me to supply to, for you, provide for you. But this way that she ignored their needs because she felt this day is the day of purity. It's a day of, it's likely, it's one day of what we call like, uh, in a way, maybe a little bit de uh, desecrating the, 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 what the day really bears, but it's like live on, in, La, in La La Land on Rosh Hashanah. As if everything is perfect. Live in Gan Eden. Like the two days of Rosh Hashanah is as if everything is Gan Eden. All we think about is the goodness of Hashem and His kingdomship and reigning over the world and there's no bad and there's nothing we need. It's a day of complete purity. If you can enter that day, I would say, I'd say more perfectly, more, more uh, accurately, uh, it's like to meditate. The two days of Rosh Hashanah, you're meditating. You're in a spiritual entity, total spiritual entity, nothing physical, nothing realistic right now. All it is is, is, is just the holiness of Hashem, it's just the spirituality, it's just the goodness of Hashem. Those are the two of Rosh Hashanah. And if we're able to meditate, to so that level, it's very difficult. After all, we're human beings. After all, we, we, we breathe, we eat, we sleep, we, we drink. We... But still, do all of that, or especially during davening, during davening, try to be in a world that's perfect right now. Because you're just looking at the collective, and you're just looking at the potential, and you're just looking at the purity of the desire where it's supposed to be the planning of the world. Then it breaks down to your actual life. That's how it is. Uh, sorry, Ivory, you were going to say something. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say that maybe when you look at R, maybe it's even higher than that because we all act in a way that brings, you know, Kabot to our matter, the whole world become an R like OEM. It's not just for us, it's for maybe the whole idea is that we have to all get our act together personally as a nation and then show the whole world what it is. And it's, that Rosh Hashanah is even for, because it's for the whole world, that Shem is king of, of the whole world. And really to add that bit, it's not just us, it's really we are all like OEM and we can, that's what we want to do in Rosh Hashanah as well. Uh huh. Of course, right. You're very, you're very right about that. It's not just us, even not just us as a nation. Definitely not us as personalities, as 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 individuals. But it's not even us as a nation. It's the entire world. That's why you begin. The entire world, entire universe, and that's by Ten Kavod Hashem LaMecha. That's by us, as a collective, as a nation, doing what we're meant to do, right. But it's not even thinking of what's meant to be corrected as a nation. Don't even think of that. It's the fact that our nation is what it is, internally, a pure nation, a nation of holiness, a nation of the children of Hashem. That's who we are, really. We're not there yet, actually, but that's where we're meant to be, and that's how who we are internally. But you're right. It's all in order to lead to be Leol Goim, to enlighten the world with the concept of Hashem as the King of Kings, the concept of Hashem being good to all, the concept of Hashem uh, leading the world. And that's what's meant to be. That's all you think about Rosh Hashanah. And that's why the Gra, the Gaumi Vilna, when he used to hear the blowing of the shofar, every time he heard the blowing of the shofar in Rosh Hashanah, he had a huge smile on his face. He was filled with happiness. They said you could see his face glowing with happiness when he heard the shofar. It's unlike many of us. We feel the shofar, so we tremble, and we, we're, we're afraid, we're scared. Listen to this sound, and, and it awakens, awakens all kinds of fears in us, and uh, regrets, and chuba and all that. The Grad didn't feel that when he heard the shofar. That's maybe when, you, well, we don't blow the shofar, but we don't blow the shofar in Elul time. I was going to say, blowing the shofar after Rosh Hashanah, we don't blow it anymore. During the, ten day, the eight days of Sesame Tshuva. But we blew the shofar in Elul time. That's how Itaka Shofar Bayir Baham Lo Yecheradu. The Navi said, Prophet says, when you hear the shofar blowing in the town, in, in, in town, you don't get scared. You're not afraid. That's the shofar of Elul, where it makes you, awakens you. But the shofar of Rosh Hashanah is the shofar of reigning the king. Here he's coming. It's a tr- like the trumpet. And then a very important person comes in. It's the trumpets that declare and announce Hashem coming into this world as the king. That's what the shofar really is. So it's complete happiness. You're, you're, in, you're in cloud nine when you hear the shofar. You're in the top of the world. You're, you're the, you're in a, the climax of, of what it's meant to be, the geula. But it's all potential. It's all b'machshava. It's all herayon, harat olam. But it's all the, true, the truth of what we really are. It's not something that's uh, false and, and, and make-believe. It's real. It's really inside us. Inside each and every us as a person, inside us as a nation, inside the world as a world, really inside us, we accept the Shem as the king. And we want to do good. And we're pure and we're holy. We say every day, that never gets ruined or blemished or, or, or impured by anything we do. Inside us, we're totally pure. And that's all we need to connect to on Rosh Hashanah, just to our internal purity. That gives us so much strength. That's the Or, Hashem Ori. That's the light uh, within us. The light within us is the Neshama, is the part, is the part of Hashem within us. And that light enables us to go through the entire year to actualize this potential, to actualize this in real life. Because we receive so much light on Rosh Hashanah that we have this strength, spiritual strength, to go on the entire year with this holiness in us. Purity in us, connecting to that. It's the energy. It's 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 a 
a day of, of tremendous energy, of good energy, positive energy, that from that we can live the entire year. Exactly. Perfectly okay. said. Perfectly okay, so said. Then, yes. Yeah. But now I'm a little confused. And then you say, Sirishmay Chuba goes into how you can, how, how you can, how you have erred in achieving that and how you want to fix it so that you can be more in line with that. Exactly. Okay. But then how does, how does the uh, L fit into that? In other words, L. Oh, seems to be more like a preparation for the Asir Shemechu, but not as much a preparation for the Rosh Hashanah. Correct. You know what I'm saying? I hear totally. So, yeah, no, you're right, totally. Elul is more like a preparation towards Yom Kippur. And the days before, preparing towards Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah is like, it's like take a stop, take a pause, a pause of two days. It's meant to be one day. And lift off, like sort of lift off to somewhere else totally or somewhere very, very deep inside you to get that tremendous light because after you've been working hard on Elul to strive to become a good, better person, actually you need the energy boost exactly. You need something to strengthen you because sometimes people can fall after a whole month whole month of, of, of regretting and asking forgiveness and slichos and, and correcting your ways and feeling bad about what you've done during the year, you can fall. You can feel miserable. It comes of Shoshana and gives you a boost of energy. It reminds you, don't forget, you're not alone. You're not, you're not battling your own battle yourself. You're part of the collective. You're part of Kalal Yisrael. After all, the neshama that lies in you is holy and pure. Don't forget that. And then go back to your work. But it's like, you're right, it's like a pause of a day or two. It gives you this tremendous positive energy to be able to continue working on yourself. Otherwise, a person can't just be judgmental on himself. I'm talking about himself, judgmental all the time. And without getting uh, get depressed, exactly. You have the press, so you need that light to get you happy, to, to, to see that face of the grog glowing with happiness when he hears the sofa. And that you can work on onwards uh, to Yom Kippur, towards Yom Kippur. Okay, so I hope uh, we live up to this message, to this, uh, live up to this uh, um, fulfillment of Rosh Hashanah, the days of the Rosh Hashanah. Of Rosh Hashanah. And, uh, ah, maybe one last thing. <clears throat> the, the, the only direct of mitzvah, Rosh Hashanah, is the blowing of the shofar. It's actually not the blowing, it's the hearing the sound, the shua kol shifa, the hearing the sound of the blowing of the shofar. That's the mitzvah. You hear the sound of the shofar. How is that connected to all that we just said now? Why was that chosen by Hashem to express this internal holiness, this achdut unity of Klal Yisrael, this reigning of Hashem as the king, why is all that all within that one blow of the shofar? Or a hundred blows of the shofar, of listening to the sound of the shofar being blown. So, if you recall, in the days of creation of the world, Adam was created by the mud, the earth that made his body, made his body from the earth, and the Shem blew into him a neshama by pach beapav nishmat chayim. By Adam, the nefesh chaya. Only after the Shem blew into him a neshama, his soul, that's what made him a, li- a living creature. Beforehand, he was just a dummy, a, 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 a piece of clay, a lump of clay. And then he became live. That blow of Hashem, which is man de nafach midile nafach, says the Zohar. One who blows, blows from inside himself, right? Where does the air come from? 
from inside yourself when you blow a balloon. The air comes from, from within you into the balloon. So it says, Azor, man de nafach, midile nafach. If Hashem, sort of speaking again, we can't fathom and understand what, it, what does that mean, but if Hashem blows into Adam or Ishan, into this clump of clay, blows from his air, so to speak, into Adam Rishon, so it's coming from Hashem, it's a piece of Hashem. So that's why the Neshama is called Chelek Eloka Iman, in the book of Eov. Eov says the Neshama is Chelek Eloka Iman, it's a piece of Hashem within us, because that's that blow, Hashem blow into us. And that's that purity, holiness, goodness, potential that we have in us, that is straight, that is sincere, that is always striving to do good, that's the neshama, that's the soul we've got in us. That's what the shofar is. Blow, it's that blow, it's to remind us, on this day of Rosh Hashanah, this is a day of creating in potential, the same six days of actual, actual, actualizing the birth of the world in Nisan were done in the planning on Tishrei. So that's what we're hearing the Bon Yishofar. We're feeling the 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 the, the, the Shem blowing into us in the Shama. So we are reminded of our Neshama inside, our soul inside, which is totally pure and holy because it comes from Hashem. And then we know where to strive to be better, better Jews because we want to fit our potential. When does a person feel content with his life? The more he fits his own potential, the more he he actualizes who he is. That's when he feels more content, more happy. So the happiest we can get is when we're aware of this holy potential, of this holy soul that we have in us, and we strive and we strive to fulfill that potential. So that's the shofar, what it what it comes to tell us, what it comes to remind us of. That's why that's the moment of greatest happiness that can ever be. That we feel Hashem blowing into us from His own self, from His own entity blowing into us. The Baal Tokea is fortunate enough to represent as if to represent Hashem. He's like the Shliach Tibor. He's a he's the messenger of Hashem to blow into us the Neshama. That's why the Baal Tokea has to be a righteous person on his own. We have all kinds of halachic requirements of who the Baal Tokia should be. And there's some Balit Kia who go to the mikveh before they blow the shofar. There's some who say many pieces of Zohar before they blow the shofar. They get into the mood of Kavana, a very high level Kavana. It all depends on the level of the Baal Tokia. It's not meant to be a person who just knows how to blow a trumpet. So he's good. <laughs> yeah, if don't trumpet play it doesn't, it's, it's nice. It's also important for him to know how to blow the shofar, but it's besides that, it's much more holy than that. As it said, it represents the blowing of Hashem into us in the shama. And the fact, one last point, is that the shofar is speechless. There's no words. It's just no words. The sounds. So I'm not going to go through each and every sand, what it represents specifically. There's a whole piece of Rav Kook, amazing, amazing. What each one of them, the Tkiah, the Shvarim, the Trua, and then the Tkiah over again. What each one of these sounds represent and how, does that, how is that supposed to awaken within us to do good? All kinds of things that are amazing in Rav Kook about this. But I will mention one thing. The fact that there's no words coming out of the shofar and there's no words as we declare Hashem is our king, that's the, that's, that's the unity, that represents the unity within Akhval Yisrael. Because if we say a word, that already defines who we are. Any word you say defines who you are. Defines what your opinion is about things. Defines what your ideology is. Defines your way of thinking. Defines what you believe in. All that we put aside, as we said before, Rosh Hashanah is not who we are personally. Rosh Hashanah is the collective of Klal Yisrael all together in front of Hashem. And we're just a piece of dust in within that. And therefore, there's no words. Because any word you say 
already differentiates. Every word you say already puts you in a category, categorizes them. This way, it's just a sound. Everyone, everyone in the world hears the same way, hears the same sound. So that expresses the unity amongst them. Now, we're not different from the one next to us and the one beside us and the one in front of us and the one back of us and the one down, praying here and praying there. We're all one group, one, one piece. That's why there's no differentiation. We're just hearing a sound. It makes us all one collective. So those are the two ideas we said. The potential is holy and good. And we're not speaking about ourselves now. We're speaking about the collective standing in front of Hashem. And hopefully... Um, publicizing this to the entire world, for the entire world to believe in Hashem as, as the Lord of the universe. Okay, so that's for um, peace for Rosh Hashanah. Whoever's going to be in the social hall first night, uh, they asked me to speak there for the first night to Rosh Hashanah, so uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry if they're going to hear a repeat. <laughs> but it's there, it's not going to be as long as this, because they'll throw me out <laughs> for the sake of the especially in the, for the sake of the cloud right yeah. think of the cloud don't not to see, right not to think of myself um so i'll be saying in short form uh, all this in hebrew so uh, whoever is there i'm sorry but uh, it's always good to hear things over again uh, until they get absorbed in us uh, they once asked her to be the cook Yeshiva Mecca Zarab, he was a Yeshiva Mecca Zarab many years. They asked him to be the cook, how come you always repeat and repeat and repeat the idea of Avas Yisrael? He was always speaking about Avas Yisrael. That was his main, main message. In all different directions, always he got to Avas Yisrael. So they asked him, we, we've heard it a hundred times, two hundred times, a thousand times from you. It's enough, we heard. So he goes, as much as I repeat, it's not enough. Because to really feel Abbas Israel, you need thousands of times to repeat the message over and over. To really be there, really be at Abbas Israel, to really, really think that way. So twice isn't much if you hear one <laughs> over again. It's not a thousand times yet. Okay, so now let's do some Shemitah halachos. It's after all, also, by, the way, by the way, I'll just mention a very cute point that Rishon Zaman says, is coming Monday night when we're at Kiddush, by Kiddush, and we're going to be saying Shechianu. So normally every year we say Shechianu for the new year. The new year has come, so Shechianu v'kimanu v'gyanu l'zman hazet. It's new time. Mm-hmm. Says Rishon Zaman, when it's a Shemitah year, have in mind, besides this being a new year, have in mind Shechianu v'kimanu v'gyanu l'zman hazet to a Shemitah year. This is also a Shechianu of, of a of, to, to come to a Shemitah year, which is a holy year, which is a special year, which is a year of so many special conducts and deeds and so, and so much uh, um, spirituality in this year. A feeling actually connects very well to Rosh Hashanah because the entire year of Shemitah is meant to give us the feeling that Hashem is really in charge of the world and not we. We're not the bosses. We don't own anything, really. We all... Hashem only gives us stuff, uh, provides for us from, from his good goodness, from his good heart. It's not we own anything, really. He lets us borrow. He lets us use what he owns. Kili ha'aretz. Hashem owns the entire world and anything in it. And we just borrow it from him. So this year of Shemitah, we express that we're not the bosses. We're not the owners. We're not the landlords. We can't work the land normally. We can't harvest normally. We can't use the fruits any way we want. It's all Hashem's. Uh, we all, he's the boss. He's the landlord. We take from him. And besides that, it's the year of meaning it's the year of chesed. The entire year, we allow anyone into our garden, anyone into the fields, come and take whatever you'd like. So, it's the year of Chesed. It's the year of Achlu Ibnei Amecha. Please take all the needy. Take uh, all you need from my, from my property. So all these concepts make this year a very, very special year. 
Although, unfortunately, most, most, most of us in the world, but also in Eretz Israel and Am Israel, are not farmers. We don't, we don't have fields. We don't work in agriculture. So we don't get the feeling enough of what Shemitah really is. It barely, it barely enters our life. I'm not talking about those who live in apartments who don't even have backyards, don't even have a gina, a, a, a garden to, to, to in there. A few, uh, a few meters of, of some grow of some fruits, uh, fruit trees and uh, plants. Uh, so they barely, barely feel anything with Shemitah. So what type of food do they buy? Had to mechira or nochri or tzara. It's, that's a little thing that they have to be aware of and, and, and act upon. But you don't get the whole feeling of what really Shemitah has meant to be. You're not, the, you're not the farmer who now has to go out for vacation for an entire year and not work the land and rely on Hashem to provide for him. The Torah says, I will command a special blessing on the land that on the sixth year, every sixth year of the Shemitah cycle, you'll get the blessing that will have three times as much as normal, so you'll be able to have to provide for three years. You need the Shishit, the Shviit, and the Shminit, because the beginning of the eighth year, we can't do much either. A lot of it is still fruits growing from the Shviit that still have the holiness of the Shemitah, and still you can't use them normally. So... All of that is a feeling of true belief in Hashem, like totally to believe in Hashem and not to think that you're in charge of anything, not to think that you can do it, you can do it alone. That's the whole meaning of Shemitah. And we lack, we lack that feeling in this modern day and age that we have nothing to do with, with, with the land anymore. Maybe unfortunately. So at least we'll learn about what's meant to be, even if we don't actually live upon it. Live by by. <laughs> did that occur? And this this is the sixth year. So did the farmers who keep shmita? Did they have a bumper crop this year? Um, it's a good question. I have heard stories. I don't know about this specific year, but I've heard in previous shmitas that they spoke about the um, kibbutzim, moshavim, mishavim. They were observant shmita, observant Jews like Chafetz Chaim, like Yisodot, like all those mostly Haredi. But Haredi workers that used to work. Halag, that is exactly. It's no more. It, it extin- extinguished, right? It's a part. Used to be a party. It used to be a party in the Knesset, Halagodat Israel, which weren't Agudat Israel. It's not Aguda. It's those that were Haredi on one hand, but they like torn their heretz. They used they to also shirts. work. <laughs> yeah, like today the blue shirt Haredi. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they used to work, uh, and ma- many of them were farmers in in, in these kibbutzim. So, um, so I, I've heard stories that it did work actually for them, that they had the, the abundance, the, the boost of, uh, of produce in the sixth year to supply for all three years. Some say that the Torah meant for this to work only when Shemitah is their right, because it's a Torah blessing you, blessing us. So the Torah can only bless when we're fulfilling the Torah mitzvot of Shemitah, and that's only when majority of Am Yisrael will be living in the country. Great majority, not even 51%. It has to be kol yashvei Kol doesn't mean every single Jew. But it means a great majority living in Israel, like the Yovel. When the Yovel will come back to practice, so will the Shemitah become their right. That's connected to the Yovel. And we're far from it. Now, I just heard yesterday, last night on radio, they always give a count of all kinds of numbers because it's the new year. Of what? Six million Jews. Oh, that I didn't hear. I didn't hear how many Jews living in Israel. That could be the figure. I did hear the following. There are 15,200,000 Jews in the world, which I was very happy to hear. 15,200,000 Jews, which makes it getting back close and closer to we were before the Alakah. I don't know if that's No, they said, oh, yeah. oh, so they gave a different figure for those who are entitled to Chok HaShavut, 18 million. 18 million are entitled for Chok HaShavut to live in Israel. And 15 million, 200,000 are Jews. I, I'm assuming they're counting who is really from a Jewish mother in the 15 million. So that's very nice to hear. We're going, creeping slowly to the point where we were before the Alakats of 18, 18 million we were. 
and we were wiped out, a third of us were wiped out. So we wiped out, so we got to 12 million, now we're back to 15 million. So we haven't gotten back yet to what we were before, but we're getting there slowly. And then they said, 45% of those 15 million, 200,000 living in Israel, 45%. So we're not yet, uh, you can make calculations now, yeah. Right. Rabbi, yeah. in um, in the in the show, they distribute these uh, Torah tidbits from the OU Israel Center. Yes, yes. And uh, the the lead article is always from the executive director, Rabbi uh, Avi Berman. Uh huh. In this in this issue's Torah tidbits, he writes about um, his family. Every year, they have they have grapevines in their backyard, so they have a family get together and and pick all the grapes. And he said that the crop this year was more than double the previous year. <laughs> ah, you hear? Very nice. Yeah. Wait, Robbie, Ber Robbie Berman is Alex's brother, no. correct? Oh, no, not that. No, 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 no. I think it's a different firm. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's ah, not the one from- that's in Wayu. He's in Wayu. Right, this, that's Ari oh, Berman. Ah. This is uh, Avi Berman, and I think he's in Jerusalem or the Gush. I'm oh, Jerusalem, sure. that's what I couldn't understand. If we're talking about the one in YU, he lives in America. So. No, 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 this is the OU, okay, so OU, OU Israel okay. Center. OU is, okay, okay. Yes, that's right, it's in the <laughs> from this uh, Shabbat. Okay, very good. Well, here's the answer, uh, Sender. And for Sender's question, it works, for Hashem. So even with Shabbat, because it's not yet, even majority yet living in Israel, but still, uh, it works, okay, for Hashem. Rabbi, correct me if I'm wrong, but to my understanding, everything Rob mentioned now about the vast majority of them being there to throw yeah. and yoga having to take place. Puts me there yeah. to be back in our Ruben has to live or Ruben has to live. Correct. Correct. That's part of Yobel coming back. Yobel right. is dependent right. on. That's an integral part of it also. Correct. So even Correct. if we had eight, even if we had 10 million Jews here, yeah. we weren't living in our Yerusha. According to the lands that we're. Land, doesn't count here, Correct. Right? Correct. Correct. That, that's, I guess it's Chazal. Call Aleha, right. Yoshevei Aleha means that besides selling the land, it has to be Yoshevei Each one, mm -hmm. each tribe living in its part of the section of the land that's meant to be for that tribe. So first we had to have Eliyahu Navi tell us which tribes we are. Yeah, we don't even know which tribes we are now. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I think you should line belongs to all of us, right? Correct. Correct. Whoever could afford it, 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 whoever Okay, so that's uh, the meaning. Yes, that's why Rav Shomazamin said that in your Shechianu of this coming Kiddush, the first day of Rosh Hashanah this coming year, have in mind to include Shemitah year. Shemitah year specifically is the special Shechianu that we got to this point that we have once every seven years. That's a good thing to have in mind, right? Yeah, right, at the table, correct? Right. And maybe you can explain two words the meaning of Shemitah, the way we explain that, that they should feel the excitement of the year. For many people, Shemitah is a pain in the neck. <laughs> Instead of being for many people, they take it as a difficult year. Oh, you know, another Shemitah year now. Like to take care of all the fruits and vegetables, what to eat, what not to eat, how to eat it, how to... But, uh, and especially for farmers who are observant, they can take it very difficultly. They can say, oh no, what's going to be this year? I can't work my land normally and this and that. But if we believe really in Hashem and all that he promises us, then we're supposed to be at ease and calm and, and, and happy, happy with what, uh, with the holiness of the year and the fruits and vegetables that bear special holiness this year. As we eat them, besides all the halachos involved, we're eating holier fruit. Even within the produce of Eretz Yisrael, which is already holy, as we mentioned many times, the Bach in Siman Reish Chet explains that every fruit or vegetable that nurtures from the ground of Israel is holy. In essence, there's holiness in the fruit. So you take a bite in an apple that was 
that grew in the land of Israel, you're absorbing in you the holiness of the soil of the ground of Israel. And every apple, every orange, every pear that, that, that grew in Eretz Israel. Besides that, Bach, on the Shemitah year, the holiness fruit climbs up much, much higher in every single fruit because it's all a holy year. It's a holy year from the produce of what comes from the land. Uh, reading the fruit in your statue, getting the soul of the Shofar, if you're saying it that way. Wow, 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 wow. Yeah, yeah, you're doing very good. You're doing very good. Yeah, wow. That's what it meant to be. That may, unfortunately, the Shayao and Navi tells us not to fulfill the mitzvot ke mitzvat anashim elumadah. Out of uh, routine. Many times we're fulfilling mitzvot out of routine. We're not even thinking or not even absorbing anything from the mitzvah. We're just doing it and continuing our life. Late fill in, chantalis, yo, head davening, wrap it all up, continue our life. What has that done for us? How have we changed daily, daily by tefillin, daily by tzitzis, daily by seeing the mezuzah? How does that make us better human beings? How does that make us more connected? <laughs> no, so firstly and foremostly, it's the fulfillment of the mitzvah. That's first of all, and we should be pleased and happy that we fulfill the mitzvahs. That's firstly. But uh, there's another level. There's that whole other level of, of really connecting to the essence of the mitzvah, to what it what it's meant to teach us, uh, what, what spirituality we're meant to gain from it, what uh, education, what it educates us. The Rambam says in the end of Hilchus Tmura and the end of Hilchus Me'ila, twice, the Rambam says that although all the 630 mitzvahs are Gzeira Sakasu, they're all Gzeira Samelech, he says, Gzeira Samelech, they're all uh, commandments of the king, and we're supposed to just fulfill them as, as the king commanded, with all the details and Allahs and all that. But he says, a higher level is if we attempt to understand the reasoning behind everything. Not just fulfill the mitzvahs like a, in Hebrew you say tuki, like a parrot, parakeet. I don't know if you have that expression in English. Like it repeats, it doesn't know what it's saying, it just repeats what other people say. But don't just fulfill the mitzvahs just routinely, says the Rambam. Try to f- figure out what the meaning of the mitzvah is, the time of the mitzvah, the reasoning behind it. And if we understand the reasoning behind the mitzvah, we connect more to the mitzvah, we connect more to the essence of it, and we were educated by the mitzvah. It teaches us something. And, and, and there's endless, the Rambam says there, in the same Allah, he also says that we can never reach the bottom of every mitzvah of what it really means. So, so, so deep and holy that you never reach the meaning of it. But there are endless, endless levels of explanations of every mitzvah and of every detail of every mitzvah. If you read Rabbi Aya Kaplan's, I'm sure you've seen that, Rabbi Aya Kaplan's uh, booklets, on each booklet is a different mitzvah. He did a few of them, he didn't do too many. He did Shabbos, he did Philin, he did Tzitzis, he did Mikveh, uh, a few others maybe. What uh, wonderful, wonderful booklets, the thin, thin booklets that go through those specific mitzvahs, each booklet separately, a different mitzvah, go through deeper and deeper ideas behind the mitzvah. And you read that, it's all based on Chazal, Kabbalah, all that. You read his, his chapters one after the other, you feel you're on a journey. You feel you're on a <laughs> you're He was also just doing that's also true. Huh? Yes. I knew he was a physicist. I didn't know look here, physicist. I knew he was a physicist. Oh, they write in the back of the, uh, the booklets that he was in the who's who of, who's who of America, physics, of physics yeah. in America. He was a tremendous he was genius. Lived at 48, I think. Yeah, yeah the age of 48, he passed away very young. And he wrote those, he was very active in Cuba and America, NCSY. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. So, wrote so that's how he wrote them? He wrote that to try to, you know, bring people closer, right? Right. It definitely works for it for me. <laughs> it's tremendous, tremendous. He has a whole book on uh, meditation in Judaism. Jewish meditation also must be amazing. And that one I didn't read yet. They want one in India. Ah, that's why. Ah. So to counter, to counter the, the woman in India and took 
wants to meet with the squatty, and, she, and, 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 they, and they won't let her meet her, and she, she pushes herself. She, she has a three-word message for him. Ah, uh, yeah? She, she knocks on the door, and the shamus comes and says, uh, whatever. Squatty, the whatever. You can't see who he's. Yeah. Tell him about it. Meditating. It's very word, What's the three word message? Sheldon, come home. <laughs> right. It was no, it was all you did. It was all you did. Wow. It was very sad. Oh, you know, Yeah, Hani uh, Lifshitz from uh, Chabad. She's a very famous Chabad uh, house in uh, one of these places, uh, India or, uh, or Thailand. Right, right, right. The Himalayas, Himalayas, right. So she says a story, she said a personal story about herself, uh, that she knew there was a Jewish boy who was in one of these uh, prayer... Uh, yeah, one of the leaders, very strong. Uh, and uh, slowly, 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 she was able to get him back to, to Judaism. It was a long story of how she did it. Uh, the funniest thing was, is it was through his stomach, because she knew what type of food he loved. And he didn't get that food in the you know, words where he was. Yeah. <laughs> they were nice to fill the fish or whatever. So through the food, she had him back. Through that, she made him, she prepared all that food over and over again for him. And that reminded him of his previous life. She got him back. I think she's the one they wanted to give her the cover to light the candle for. Yeah, the torch, the torch. The torch. The torch, right, right. The torch. Yeah. yeah. Above, wouldn't let her, yeah. Because it's not so new or something. Or it's too Zionistic, yeah. Chabad are Zionistic. Anyhow, um, yeah, so that was about the Sheikh Yan. Okay, uh, we'll just do a few words of uh, halacha after all. Uh, but it's good, we did this more spiritual uh, preparation for the year. Um, we spoke about the various different uh, melachos of Shvit, what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. Uh, very briefly, we spoke about the fact that there's a difference between ukme and avure. Anything that you do in the in the field or in the land or in your garden to um, to inha- to help exist what's existing, to help it exist, that's allowed. But if it's to flourish, to grow more, to, 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 to grow larger, that's not allowed. That's the main categorical difference between the those actions, the the malachos, the the the. the, the um, work we're allowed to do in our field, in our garden, and the work we're not allowed to do in our field. Uh, we also said try to do the mo- most you can unprofessionally without a gardener, because the gardener does professionally, then he makes things grow more, uh, or he takes care of things that you're not meant to. Like, for example, if you s- clean out the, the, the land, the ground totally uh, from all the weeds that have grown, that's not good because that looks like you're preparing to plant seeds. You want to empty out the ground, for, ground from, from the weeds in order to plant seeds of, of good things. And that's not allowed. You're not allowed to plant seeds on the entire year of Shemitah. So you mustn't clean out, clean the, 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 the garden totally from all the weeds. What you do is you cut them from a little bit higher than the ground. They have to stick out of the ground a little bit and cut them there instead of uprooting them from the bottom. From, from inside, so that it, you show that you're not planning on planting any seeds there because the weeds are still here. You just tie them low for them not to grow high stocks of, of, of weeds, which is bad looking and it's sometimes dangerous. The, so the snakes can hide between the weeds. So you cut them down, but not all the way down to the ground. You leave a little bit sticking out. All these types of ideas gardeners don't know about, many of them. I, I could go on the ladder and, and, and give a little haircut. Exactly. Give a little haircut. There, I mean, maybe dumb question. Is there any of you know, the modern Zionists that put the weeds or shoes and stuff out on the street and give a haircut? What about it? No, no, you don't have to care of that. If you did it properly, people can, people should think, Ladun uh, Lechavschut, in favorably, think, judge you favorably that you did it where you're allowed to. And it's not, yeah, not, not, it's okay to put that outside for the trucks, truck to take it out, take it away. Um, you can have the gardener do it, but you have to explain to the gardener the way to do things. You can have a gardener do that until you're climbing up yourself, or you don't have the equipment or whatever. You can ask the gardener to do it for you, but 
Spain the gardener, don't do the regular job you do every year. Do much less of cutting and things. Now, watering also, you, have to, you do have to water because that's for the existence of the trees and plants, but you water less frequently than every other year. The watering goes like this. You can water at the time when you're watering, it doesn't matter the amount of water, you can give it as much as you'd like, but the frequency has to be, has, has, has to be less frequent. That's the difference between watering in this coming year and other years from before. You water less frequently, but at the time where you're watering, you can water as much, you can give as much water as you'd like. There's no amount, uh, specific amount, but there's the frequency has to be less frequency. That's that's what they that's what the post scheme uh, spoke about watering. Um, well, can you speak for a moment about those of us who are landlocked in the apartment? Yeah, the only thing we have <laughs> plants on their a flowering little plant. Or flower pots. Yeah. Pot, right. Oh, thing. so that was exactly the next point I was going to talk about. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. You brought it up. That's exactly the point. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I'm, a, I'm a tenant and there's a, a right. sprinkler. It's, it's, it's on some kind of automatic uh, computerized. I didn't until one morning I was up. <laughs> so I, so I, I should, I, I'm assuming I can figure out how to work it. Maybe yeah. turn it off one, like turn it off Monday and Thursday or something like that. Um, for 15 minutes, make it go for 10 minutes. No, no. So the 15 versus 10, you no, don't no. need to. Now you don't need to change twice a week as much as you'd like at the time. Like right, less frequent. Uh, it goes once a day. For 15 minutes in the morning. That's it. Yeah. Once a day, 15 minutes in the morning. Yes. Yeah, so I would skip two days in the week, right? Okay. Correct. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Three, day, whatever. But just like three days, right. Frequency. Make sure, make sure you're, is this for grass? For grass? No, or grass there? Uh, Trees, uh huh. I don't, I have a, I make have, sure you're not I killing them. Ah, that's, that's all right. So, you have to ask a professional gardener how much less frequent can you do this uh, watering so that it won't kill them, but it won't make them dry. Me, the fl flowers. Don't worry. Right, right, more than in the summer, right? So, in the summertime, you have to ask him that how much will make the tree exist. And not flourish so much. That's all. That's the amount of times you need to flood, uh, water it right. Okay. And you do, by the way, that what I said before is you can even do it for 20 minutes every time and skip two days. That's also okay because the amount of water every time you give it is 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 no doesn't matter. There's no limit, but the frequency counts. So less frequent makes it look like you're not doing it normally. It's the idea of not doing it normally, but the time. Of each time, the, the amount each time you do it is, a, is, is a limitless. Okay, now for pots and plants that we have indoors. Now, indoors means under a roof. Because sometimes a person has a mirpeset, a, a balcony that's under the sky. There's no roof on, on top of it. I'm talking about now under roof. So it, have, it could be inside the apartment. You have all kinds of pots with plants inside the apartment. Or on a mirpeset, which has an overhead to it, has a roof to it. So in this situation, we've got the following issues. Firstly, there's a Yerushalmi. The Yerushalmi speaks about Sadcha lo tizra veshavta aretz shabbat l'ashem. There are two concepts that the Torah uses, two words that the Torah uses to, to explain to us in what location should we, keeping, should we be keeping Shmita In your fields, Sadcha, in your fields. And in the land, Bishavta Aritz, in the land, field and land. What is a house? When it's inside a house, it's definitely not a field. A house isn't a field, unless you own a huge house and you play soccer in your, in your living room. But uh, your house is a house, it's a bite, it's not a field. On the other, so from that point of view, the Rishali begins by saying that it should be that in a house, inside the house, which there's a roof on top. There's no Shemitah issue. You can plant, you can water, you can fertilize, you can cut it off, whatever you want to do. Prune, any type of work you want to do inside the house. There's no Shemitah because it only says Sadcha. Only in the fields you, know, you have to keep Shemitah. But on the other hand, says Rishami, it says Rishavta Aritz. The land has to rest. <clears throat> now, 
definitely stuff that's connected to the land, even if it's under a roof, is considered nurturing from the ground, from the aretz. So you have to stop and refrain from work or anything that's uh, nurturing from the ground. That's called atzitz nakuv. Atzitz nakuv is when you have a pot with a plant in it that has, ho that has holes on the bottom. The holes on the bottom create a connection between the soil that's in the pot and the land itself, the soil in the land itself where the house is on top of. Now, but inside the house, there's no, there's no connection to the, to, the, right? to the ground underneath. Yeah. Why? Yes. You have a floor. You but under the floor, floor, under that, there's ground, there's actual uh, soil. Under it's built shite. on the soil, under the shite. Or you under the most parts, most parts flooring. Are, even if it has holes in it, it sits on, on, on another. It sits it's on a another, plastic on uh, exactly. plate, like plastic a plastic plate. plate. Right. And the ground plastic plate. On your marble floor. <laughs> right. Okay. And under, under the marble floor is, is, is dirt. Okay. Terrific. Oh, okay. That's a good question as well. You're on the second floor, third floor, where are you connecting to the ground from there? Right. So it goes like this. It goes like this. So until so we spoke about until now is a is a pot that has holes, does not have a plastic plate underneath the holes. It's just directly onto the ground. I think most do, but topless. Most do in order to accumulate the water. When you water it, it right shouldn't here. drip all over all over yeah. the floor. So you need to accumulate the water. That's why they have it, right? Even though, even though some posts can speak about the fact that the leaves and branches go beyond that plate, it doesn't go straight up, straight up on right. from that plate onwards. Right. It goes beyond the plate. So there's some talk about nurturing from the le the leaves. And the, and, the, and the flowers and whatever is growing that goes beyond that plate is nurturing from the ground. There's some minerals that come up from the ground and the leaves and, 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 and branches and, and flowers nurture from the ground directly because they're growing on the sides from the sides of the pot and not underneath a plastic plate. Some posts can speak about that. It's hard for us to understand because uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no. maybe that was the reason. Yeah, but still, the minerals go from the up in the air from the ground up and absorbed, abs get absorbed yeah, into the leaves. No, from the sun. Yeah, that's the sun. Yeah, that's sun. That's not that. No. Not the minerals in the ground. That's v'shavta aret. Doesn't say v'shavta shemesh. The sun does that. You don't need to stop the sun from work on the shemitah year to stop the soil from work on the shemitah. So it's very hard for to understand in our days what they're talking about. But let's put it this way. The post scheme finally decided that within the house, ah, so first I'll tell you, uh, I'll finish the Rishami. The Rishami says, since on one hand, the Torah speaks about a field, Sadcha. On the other hand, Haaretz, Shavta Haaretz. So a house is not a field. House meaning there's a roof on top. is not a field but it is aretz, it is connected to the ground, it is part of the soil of the ground. So the Sushami ends off by saying, suffix shvis in a house. Anything that grows in a house, suffix, we're in, a, we're in doubt whether shvit applies for that or does not. That's how the Sushami concludes, suffix shvi. So the path of Shulchan, who was one of the greatest students of the Gra. We saw Mishi Klov wrote the book Path and Shulchan, which is all about the mitzvahs of Tzur Baaretz, because he was from that group of students of the Gra that made Aliyah. There's a whole group of Talmidei Hagra. The Gra made they're the first ones together with Talmidei Baal Shem Tov. There were two sides of the camps of the Litvaks and the Hasidim back then. They were in a great fight, unfortunately, one against the other. But they both had their students who came to live in Israel approximately the same time, 300 years ago. So this Rabbi Yisami Shiklo was one of the greatest students of, of the Gra that made Aliyah at, that time, at the time. And he wrote a whole book on Mitzvah Sotlid Baris because it was the first time the Jews, since the Chobar Beit Samid Shasheni, the Jews had to start practicing this Mitzvah Sotlid Baris. So someone had to learn out all those halachos and write a book of how to absorb these, absorb these, mitz these mitzvahs. So he writes in his book about the issue of Shemitah 
within a house that is Suffolk in Yerushalmi. He writes, Suffolk, the Rabbanon Lekula. Since Shemitah is the Rabbanon, definitely in his days. There were barely any Jews in Israel. So Shemitah was definitely the Rabbanon in his days. So since Shemitah is the Rabbanon in our days, till our, including our days, so we can go Lekula. If it's Suffolk there, we don't know what to do. It's a famous rule. Then anything rabbinic that we're not sure what to do, we go lakula. We do we do it lenient. So he finally issued a psak that any plant that grows in a house, meaning under a roof, that's the main point of consider, being considered a house. The Chazonish even says there may not need four walls. Just the fact that it's under a roof, even if it's all uh, open from all sides, but there's a roof. That's that that's what defines it a house. That's not a field. A field is when it's open to the sky. When it's not open to the sky, that's a house. So greenhouses, chalamot, the greenhouses where they grow a lot of stuff, that's not considered a field. A field is open to the sky. So according to Pata Shulchan, it's very easy. We have nothing to do on special or different to do on Shemitah in our uh, apartments. Anything indoors, nothing to, nothing to care about. We can do anything we want. But most post keep Chazonish mainly, but Rav Zaman as well and others, they deferred and argued with the Pata Shulchan and said that's not the way to issue psak for, for, uh, for this suffolk of the Yushami, because they hold that the suffolk of the Yushami is a suffolk within the psukhi of the Torah. The Torah says, Sadchalot Izra, Veshavta Aret Shabbat Lashem. So within the Pesukim of the Torah, we're not sure, we're not certain what the Torah meant about a house. Does it go, does the Torah meant to exclude, did the Torah meant to exclude a house because it's not a field, or to include a house because it is a Haaretz? So it's a suffix within the Torah, what the Torah meant. So how can you call this a suffix the Rabbana? True that the way we observe Shemitah today is only rabbinic. The whole Shemitah is rabbinic. But the suffix is a suffix they're right. The suffix is what did the Torah mean, not what Chazal meant. <clears throat> and when you ask yourselves, if you ask yourself, what did the Torah mean? You're stuck. You don't know. That's the suffix of the Yishami. So if you're suffix the right, what are you supposed to do? L'chumra. Suffix the right, L'chumra, be stringent. So we're supposed to solve the suffix by saying house is included within Shemitah year. That's how we're supposed to solve the suffix. And after we solve the suffix, L'chumra, so even if Shemitah is the Rabbanon, we're still saying that now rabbinically we have to be careful not to do any malacha of Shemitah, unpermissible malacha to Shemitah in the house because we solve the suffix on the Deoraita level of Chumrah. What would you do in your house beside water? And you only water to keep it alive. There's nothing in the house. Okay, if that's all planting, planting, you can't plant any seeds in the house. Yeah, pruning. Plum. Pruning, sometimes you have to cut off some leaves that aren't good. You cut off some branches that aren't good. Pruning, lotismo. Planting, lotizra. Um, um, fertilizing, fertilizing. Uh, taking out all kinds of, uh, I don't know if weeds grow in it, but uh, dirt that fell in there, or things of that sort. I mean, there's a lot of small things you do. And of course, watering that uh, you do for plants in the house. People do take care of it sometimes more than just watering. So all that cannot be done in the house. And watering, do you have to do it less frequently than other years? Uh, again, providing you don't kill it. it has, you're allowed to sustain it. To sustain, yes, but not to make it flourish, not to make it grow more and more. So all that are things that we have to be aware of. So, and... Uh, uh, Final psak of all this, final psak of all this, is that we go by majority of post who defer with the Pat of Shulchan and say that we have to be more stringent and to go on the stringent side, even under roof, to keep Shemitah. But, but, here comes a big but. Says of Shlomo in the following. All this is true when the plant is nurturing from the ground, because remember, the whole suffolk of the Yishami was the Shavta Aritz. It has to be something that grows from the ground in order for it to have Shemitah. If it's disconnected from the ground, there's definitely no Shemitah. Now, here it goes on two levels. If it's disconnected from the ground, but yet it's under this, it's, it's, it's exposed to the sky, 
there's no roof. Let's say in the case where you have a mirpeset, you have a porch outside of the apartment, and there's no roof on top. It goes straight to the sky. You build your sukkah there. That's where you build your sukkah. So you have some pots there of flowers and things of that sort. So that is not considered a house. As you said, the definition of a house is a roof on top. That's already considered sadeh. That's like a small mini field. Because the definition of a field is not the, 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 um, the, the, the um, uh, size of it. It's the fact that it's under the sky. Any soil, any soil that grows things from it under the sky is considered a field. So you have a small field there. Sadeh katan. Even though it's a planter. Even though it's a planter. But, oh, but, but. Definitely, it needs to be also nurturing for the ground. Because it has to be included with Shavta Aretz. The whole point of Shemitah is that the, the ground doesn't work, not a pot of soil uh, that's somewhere up in the ninth floor. So, what is that considered now? It's considered Atzit Sheinonakub, outside of a house, on a field. Atzit Sheinonakub. It's a pot that doesn't have holes in it. Whether because, what David said before, it has a plate underneath. Or because it's on the second floor and onwards, says of Shlomo Zawin, as of the second floor and onwards, not the bottom floor, which is connected to the ground straight. Rather, it's the second floor and up to the hundredth floor, whatever it goes up to. That's considered teaching Olakub automatically. That's considered not nurturing from the ground. There's too much space in between. All kinds of sort of, the, of these types of situations, or you put a plastic sheet underneath a, uh, a pot with a, the with a tree. All these types of ways, you make it disconnected. In that case, what type of Shemitah do we hold? If it's a Tzitzhi Nonakuv, truth of the matter should have been no Shemitah. Because we just said, it's not Sadcha and it's not Vishavta Haaretz. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not nurturing the ground. There's nothing to do with Shemitah. With. But here we have a famous, famous Gzeira, Gzeira decree of Chazal, rabbinic decree, Gozrim, Gazrin al Atzit Sheino Nakuv, Atu Atzit Nakuv. Chazal made a general gzera in Shabbos and in uh, Orla, Kilaim, all kinds of halachos that have to do with plants. They made a, a decree that we hold of each and every one of these areas of halacha by Atzit Sheino Nakuv. Rabbinically, we forbid everything to be done as if it were Atzit Nakuv. Why? Because if we allow people to do anything they'd like on Shabbos and Kilayim and Ola and Shemitah, all these issues, if we allow any, all to be done freely at Tzitzhi and Olakub, the one that's disconnected from the ground, ninth floor or, or, or plastic sheet underneath, any of these types, if we allow anything to be done, people will by mistake do the same for a Nakub. They'll see a pot that has a tree in it or has a plant in it or has flowers in it on the ground with some holes, and they'll say, wait, I did, I did everything I wanted on the ninth floor. Why can I do it on the ground as well? They don't realize that it's the right. It's, it's searching from the ground. So Chazal issued a decree that even though it's a tzitzhi non nakub, you still mustn't do any melacha of the same types you mustn't do for the right on a rabbinic level. So now we're, we're back to being stuck. Even if it's on a top floor, and even if it has a sheet underneath or a plastic plate or all that, it's just a tzitzhi no nakub. But after all, it's rabbinically forbidden to do all the malachos of Shemitah. Comes with Shlomo Zavin and finalizes the following. There's a whole piece by Michiel Nechet Tukachinsky in the book of Shemitah that he wrote. A whole piece saying that all this is not true because there is no place in the entire Shas, Bavli, Rishami, and all of Rishonim that discuss at Tzit Sheinon Naku by Shemitah. It only discusses by Shabbos, by Kilayim, by Ola, nothing mentioned by Shemitah by the Tzit Sheinon Naku. How can we, says Rav Tikotchinsky, how can we make up a Gzera de Rabbanon that's not written in Rabbanon? It doesn't say it in all the Shas, that Chazal issued the Kriyam Shemitah and the Tzit Sheinon Naku after the Tzit Sheinon Naku. What's that? I don't know how you will respond to that. It's a powerful question, powerful question. He says himself, he responds to himself, Tchikochinsky says himself that although he feels strongly that there shouldn't be anything of a tzitzhi on a kuv on Shemitah, should be allowed to do anything you like because there's no decree of Chazal specifically on Shemitah, 
But he says, since all poskim, really it's true, all poskim, discuss the Tishinona Kuvan Shmita as rabbinically forbidden because of the general decree we find in Chazal of Tishinona Kuvat and Akub in other areas of Shas, of Allah. So he says, Lo mela'ani libi la'kel I can't take the courage, he says himself. I don't have the courage to make a decision on a coup against all the poskim because for some reason they all compared Shemitah to all these other issues and said here also this is the same decree as, as in other issues. So, and in Shalom Zamin as well, he, he writes also, he writes that he saw the hair of, of Tikachinsky and he believes it's a true aura. It's true what he's saying, but he can't go against all the poskim. They couldn't, they couldn't have the courage. So if they couldn't, so we can't either. But Rosh Zaman says, after all this, now we understand his tremendous idea now. After all this, it says the following. All this is true if it's under the sky. Because remember, we have the Rishami saying that anything that's under the roof, even a tzitz nakum, even if it has holes and it's on the ground, but there's a roof over it, the Rishami already says that it's a suffix situation whether you have Shemitah or not. So although we said Suffolk, they're right against the Pata Shulchan, who said it's allowed because it's rabbinic, we say no, it's based on the, on the Torah, on a, on a Suffolk within the Torah, so it's supposed to be a Chumrah. But says from Zaman, what are you doing here? A double Chumrah? If we have a Tzitzche Nonaku, not a Tzitz Naku, we have a Tzitzche Nonaku, but it's disconnected from the ground. And it's under a roof. You want to tell me now, that there's going to be a rabbinic decree on something that's already in the, in the first, for the first of all, is Suffolk the Yerushalmi if it's Bichlal Shemitah or not? So he says, don't go there. Yeah. Don't go that far. Too much. Too much. So he allows. He allows. If Shalom says you're allowed to do, and other posts can disagree, but we definitely can rely on Shalom on this. And especially, especially based on Rav Tikochinsky's Yara and the Tishan Alakum that shouldn't be Bichlal Shemitah. So all this put together, Shalom Zaman allows doing anything and everything. You don't have to change anything you do during Shemitah year for a disconnected pot, any way you disconnect it. Plastic uh, plate, plastic sheet, second floor and up, anywhere that's considered going from the ground, providing it's under a roof. If those two come together, a disconnected pot under a roof, you're allowed to do anything you want no need to change anything, including planting seeds. You can plant uh, seeds in, 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 in the potteries if, you, uh, if it has those two uh, uh, situations. Yeah. <laughs> but if you have it outside, I was asked a few weeks ago. If you have it outside, with, also with a plastic plate? Not enough. Else? That's not enough. Because then, that's what I was going to say in a moment. I was asked by someone living uh, in one of the private homes, who has a mirpesa uh, in the house? It's uh, in his private home. He has like a, uh, a terrace uh, with, with no roof on top, no roof on top, and he has pots of uh, flowers there to, to present nicely uh, around the, the terrace. He can't he can't do a lot of stuff there. He has to be careful of shmita, even though they are disconnected. They're, they're in the second floor. He has a terrace coming out of his second floor of the house, not at the very bottom, so it's considered disconnected. But I told him, after all, it's considered disconnected in the field, not disconnected in the house. And disconnected in the field, we have the zero, which we don't know where it comes from, and for, rabbinically, it's forbidden to do normally everything that we do in, a normal, uh, in other years. Anything outside, even with a plastic plate, not, a, not attached to the ground, all you can do is pretty much use water and preserve. Just preserve, right. If it needs other things to preserve, if you need to cut uh, some branches that are preservation, uh, preservation, preservation. exactly anything oh, to preserve. Exactly, one of those like pergola tents to put on top of it for the year. I mean, Fine, that would, that, perfect, be, be perfect, exactly. You can, if you have if it's disconnected plus the tent on top, perfect. That's what you could also do, right? You can create the situation that it's in the house by having a roof on top of it, and then you can do anything you like when it's disconnected from the ground. Okay, so we've done that too. Um, Next year, not Hashem, <laughs> next Sunday, which is next year, um, we'll, can, we'll go into now a whole different topic on Shemitah, which is good. We finished just before the Shemitah, all the work allowed and not allowed to do in, within, our, uh, within what grows. Now we'll go into what's more relevant as of the Shemitah itself beginning, 
is the holiness of the fruit themselves, the holiness that the fruit bear on Shemitah. What does that, what rules and restrictions do we have for holy bearing fruits on Shemitah that we have to act differently with the fruit itself, the produce itself uh, during a Shemitah year? How does that work? And which fruit are holy, which fruit is not holy? Fruits, vegetables, and the whole issue of Sfichin, some issue that has to do with what we are allowed to eat, what we're not allowed to eat, uh, things of that sort. So that's, what we'll dis- that's what we'll start discussing as of next Sunday, which is actually we'll be having already the first vegetables, not fruits yet, but the first vegetables. Quite immediately after Rosh Hashanah, within two, three days after Rosh Hashanah, we will already have in the shops uh, holy bearing vegetables of Shemitah, because it goes by, by, by vegetables, it goes by lekita, by when they pick it on the ground. So any cucumbers, uh, tomatoes, uh, whatever it is, the vegetables that were picked after Rosh Hashanah of Tavshin Pei Bet, bear in them the holiness of Shemitah. And we already have to start acting properly with the holiness of Shemitah. It's going to be a few days after Rosh Hashanah because they don't pick before Rosh Hashanah to supply a week later for all of uh, for the whole country. They do it almost on a daily basis that they pick and they and they uh, disperse it to the to all the stores. So whoever will buy Otsar Arts, Otsar Beitin type produce, which is which bears the holiness of Shmita in it, will already have to know how to use how to consume that those vegetables properly and know how to get rid of the uh, parts that you don't eat properly on Shemitah. The Shemitah, yes, that's what we'll do as of this coming Sunday, which is the very beginning of the year. Yeah, <laughs> right, that's the cutting off soon. Okay, so have a Shana Tovah. Have a Shana Tovah. Great health and happiness and Nachat. Without Hashem, within Am Yisrael. <laughs> right. Shana <laughs> Tovah. Thank you so much. Shana Tovah. Okay, gladly. Shana Tovah. Morechet. All too. Bye-bye. Shana Tovah. Bye-bye. Shana Tovah to all.